Welcome back to another ComCon 2020 virtual session. Um, this time we've got Tim Panton for you. Uh, Tim uh, works at Pipe, um, a, a company that is is kind of doing awesome things with with WebRTC and more specifically WebRTC data channels. Um, I think that's a really cool part of the WebRTC spec that is really uh, underutilized. Um, so I won't take too much time from Tim at the start and I'll catch up with him afterwards. Uh, so thank you very much, Tim, and take it away. Cool. Thanks for the intro, Dan. I'm, uh, I'm actually not going to talk a great deal about the data channel, unfortunately, um, today. Uh, this, this, is, this one's about how to test a WebRTC service if you're on your own. So, um, you know, uh, particularly as a developer, and, and I'm, uh, as, as you say, I'm, I'm Tim Panton, I'm a CTO at Pipe. And I spent my life doing um, basically building a WebRTC stack that runs on small devices like this little guy here. Um, so typically kind of cameras, droids, those sorts of things. So it's a small stack that runs in that space. And I don't look anything like that. Um, and the summary for the whole talk, um, if you kind of want to know whether you need to be watching it or not. Um, it's basically about how developers of WebRTC apps can use um, cloud instances of Puppeteer to test their WebRTC app whilst they're developing it. Um, and I'm going to give you a walk through about how to do that and what the gotchas are and stuff like that. So I know if, like the older amongst you will remember this. Like This is how you used to test a Meet Me bridge in, in Asterisk or, or, or App Conf bridge in, in free switch or whatever. Um, you know, you'd round up a pile of old phones. Well, they weren't old at the time. They were current, or some of them were old. But you'd round up a pile of phones on your desk, and you'd dial them all into the bridge. And then you'd pick up one of the phones, and you'd listen to it, and you'd tap all of the others to see what whether the tap came out. And then once you'd done that, you'd put that phone down and pick up another one and tap all of them so you could, like, get the full me mesh of, like, was everybody talking to everybody else? And then when you've done all of those, you'd, you'd yell over the office to somebody else to ring into the conference bridge to make sure that the audio quality was any good. So it's like there was a very manual process that every time you were testing an app, you had to kind of go through all this whole game. Um, and that really doesn't work now, actually, for a bunch of reasons, um, not least of which is we're doing video calls, right? And so, and particularly, you know, with the virus, with the pandemic, video calls have turned into a huge thing. Um, and so, like, tapping a bunch of phones doesn't work as a way of testing it. And not only that, but we're doing with much, much bigger call groups, right? And, and, you know, it's not unusual to see a Zoom call with 50 to 100 people in it these days. So the things that we as apps are building, you know, app developers are building, are um, for much bigger groups. And testing that, I can't round up 100 phones on my desk, right? Um, and not only that, I'm working from home. So the old days of like walking down to the lab and, and having a wall of phones that you could like fire up at a, a, at a test thing, get, getting QA to run a test against it, doesn't work anymore. Right? I don't have a wall of phones to play with. And not only that, but I've got a lot less bandwidth to play with at home than I might have in an office. So I haven't got that either. And I just don't have the hands. I don't have the QA department on hand to do this. So that kind of none of those things really work. Um, but anyway, hey, there are good good new toys in the in the cloud to play with. So let's go and play with them instead. Just like for some context, um, what's the problem I'm solving? Uh, we're developing a, a WebRTC app, and I want to test it while I'm developing it. So so this is an example of, of something that, um, given that I actually spend most of my time doing IoT stuff, I had a little bit of a kind of um, pause when the um, China lockdown because nobody was shipping IoT hardware because nobody was making it. So I had a couple of months in which I was I decided to spend a chunk of time building what you might think of as socially useful WebRTC apps that fit into little niches. And this is an example of one of them. Um, it's a, a small app that's Basically, it's video calling from SMS. So if you've got somebody who you, you know well enough by SMS but isn't necessarily in your Facebook group or, or doesn't use Zoom for one reason or another, you can send them an SMS with one of our links in, and then they are instantly, they open that on their browser in the, in the phone, and they're instantly in a video call on their phone with you. And it's kind of low, 
low friction way of video calling your uncle or whatever. Um, and that's actually quite hard to test for a bunch of reasons, not least of which is that we're dealing with mobile endpoints. So you're not like you've not got the full Chrome browser experience of like digging in there and using the the the, the um, developer interface. I mean, it's still possible on the phones, but it's like clumsier, particularly when you've got two of them um, or more. And the other thing is that what we're writing, a lot of us are writing now, is much more JavaScript. So a lot of the logic happens at the edges, not in the center. So the old ways of like pushing some test rest calls in, into the server to see what happens doesn't work because the logic is actually, a lot of the logic's happening in the JavaScript in the phone. So you actually have to like test the edges and less in the middle. Um, and if you go to rendezvous.berlin, you'll see some source and some links for these, this 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 app and a couple of others. So I had this problem and I asked my peer group and bless them. Um, Dan knows who I'm talking about. I have we have this really good group of, of very positive people who kind of will help out when you ask a stupid question. And um, and the answer came back. Well, you just use headless Chrome and puppeteer in the cloud. And I'm like, I have no idea what that means, but I'll go and find out. So that's what I did. And the net result was this. Um, so this is um, this is the app that we've been talking about. Um, now I should say I made a conscious decision. Um, I made a conscious decision not to uh, have the self view in this because there's a bunch of particularly older people who aren't keen on seeing themselves. So there's no self view in this app. So basically what would happen normally is I would send this URL to somebody as, a, as an SMS, they would open it and they would be connected to me. But I want to test this and I don't want to pick up another phone to do it. So I've added a little test link in here. So if I click on that test link, it doesn't, like, it doesn't look like it works, but it actually does. And what happens is that this will now fire up a browser far away in the cloud, pass it this link, open it, and it will come back and it will run a test to me. So I'm now being sent, um, and I, you can't hear it, but there's video, there's audio in this as well. Um, I'm being sent a test stream from this cloud browser um, that's now testing my app. And it allows me to see what's happened to the user interface. I can see that, that the um, delay at the bottom is doing the right thing. I've picked up that it's a, 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 a turn server PR reflex. Um, and like all of the st and the duration counters going up the way I expect it to, and so like all of the interactive elements on the page are working the way I want them to, um, and you know, actually, you can see that the page is doing what I want it to do whilst it's doing it, and then after a few seconds, um, it'll drop the call, and then I can test whether the call cleans up properly or not. So there's like all of the sort of features that you would want. Here we go. It's just stopped after 50 seconds. It'll um, and it should detect that that call, I mean, it stops in the way that it just like closes the browser at the far end. So this is the, like the, the nobody hung up or anything. This is the test where you see like, did we catch the close down? Yes, we did. Excellent, you know. Um, so, so yeah, um, that's a way of testing my app. And it's kind of a nice thing to do. So I'm gonna walk you through how that worked. Now, um, to do this, if you want to do this for yourselves, you need a billable G Cloud account, Google Cloud account, or you need some credits on that account. Um, and not very much, actually, because it's shockingly cheap to do this stuff. Um, but And the GitHub for this is at, at, at github.com slash pipe slash fan out test. Um, and in that, in that directory, you'll find... Um, I think it's three, well, it's four files, but three interesting files. So the first one is a, is a deploy, which is just a shell script, which uh, runs the G Cloud deploy method with some parameters. The parameters are essentially what we want to call this, this thing, um, how long we want it to live for, which is two minutes, um, a maximum. Uh, the, I'm going to run it in Node.js. And then I want to run it in the USA. So like, I want to add a little bit of peril to this. I don't want to run it in the nearest data center. I want to run it further away. And it's actually, weirdly, it's cheaper as well. Um, so, so that's the kind of deploy feature. Oh, and we give it quite a lot of memory. Um, then 
this is the this is Node.js standard package thing, and I have to say I have real trouble with Node.js. I, I've never managed to install it locally. One of the joys about doing this on the cloud is that basically you can throw the thing away. Like you, you never get around to updating Node.js. You just throw it away and install a fresh one. And like I understand that all Node.js developers just basically work in Docker for exactly that reason. Like updates fundamentally don't. Uh, maybe it's just me, but I've never managed to get it to update successfully. Anyway, and so this is a this is a standard Node.js package.json. It's basically telling Node.js uh, some names, um, a description. I don't think the description actually matters. A version number, and what the dependency are. Uh, interesting dependencies are the escape HTML is is basically it's um, it, it's a templating and par uh, URL parsing thing which we use a little bit. But the meat of this is the important part is Puppeteer. Um, Puppeteer is a scriptable instance of a browser controlled by Node.js, which is amazing. Like the fact that it exists is just amazing. And, and this is the kind of core of this index.js is the core of every Node app. And in this particular one, I'm not going to show all of it because um, like there's not room. But this is the critical piece of it. Um, this is this is what happens when you run one of these demos uh, or one of these tests. It creates a headless browser using Puppeteer um, that that is controlled by this Puppeteer script. It you, we're telling that browser that hey, you haven't got a real microphone, you haven't got a real camera, just fake that up for me and say yes to any media prompts um, because obviously that gets tricky otherwise. Uh, it loads the, we set our page um, as the pipe thing there, and um, and then load it, tell the browser to load it, and we wait till the browser's loaded it. Um, we give it a little little five seconds to settle, and then we click the accept button. And this is really cool, actually. I can script finding and accepting, finding a button and clicking accept on it. Um, and you know, obviously, you can do much more complicated UX stuff, but like at that level, this is enough. And then we wait 50 seconds and we hang up. And that is actually it, right? You've just seen how you build a test um, Chrome instance to, to, to run my app. Final thing is, how do we actually invoke it? Um, well, there's two ways. This one is, is a command line one. So this, this I can run on the command line. Um, I can. Basically, I'm telling the uh, two-session thing that's running in US Central on a Cortonomous project, um, and I give it the session ID so it joins the correct room, if you like, in the, in the WebRTC app. Um, and um, on the demo, however, I didn't use this. I actually just wrapped it into a kind of hidden button on the page so that it's all in one in one thing. OK, so I've said like what we do to make it happen, but like, how does it actually work? And honestly, I have no idea. Right? Really, it's just magic. Like The fact that it, it does, sort of doesn't matter, actually, because it does work. Right? You get the result that you want from those three files. Um, and and like, how, it, how they actually pull it off, I don't know. Uh, well, I kind of do. It's sort of a bit like this. It's Google Cloud infrastructure running a Node.js, probably in Docker, but I'm not sure. Um, and then inside that Node.js, it runs a Puppeteer script. And the Puppeteer script starts a headless Chromium, and the headless Chromium runs our test page. So you got a real kind of multiple layers of virtuality there. But it doesn't matter. It just works. All right, so the sort of backing to this is, is serverless or cloud lambdas. So <clears throat> what you what I'm leveraging here is some stuff that they all the cloud providers are doing, which is essentially um, it starts out with a computer science concept, which is a lambda, which is essentially a stateless function. It's a function that sort of transforms its input to its output, or its output to its input, like, and it um, it should carry no state. So from one instance of it, one invocation of it to another, there shouldn't be any state carried over within the function. That's the kind of attribute of a lambda. Um, and they're delivered by the cloud service. And what's cute about this is that it, it the cloud service um, takes care of all the orchestration. It does it for you. It's not your problem. Um, and and so an example might be like transforming from like uh, your your balance entry on a on a 
in a database in a bank account up into a web page. So it's that sort of transform of taking one piece of data and generating a web page from it. Or conversely, you pushing a single piece of information in a post and then that going off and checking it and generating a, a new database entry or something. Now, I have to say that we're somewhat misusing them, and that gives us some caveats that, that you'll see uh, at the end. So why, do, why is this interesting? Well, what's really cute about these is because they're built for like, you know, um, um, viewing your, uh, your bank account, 10,000 people viewing their bank account all at once, is that you can run a ton of them, right? They're, they're built to scale. Um, and it's Google's problem to, to provision and deprovision the, the correct infrastructure to do that. So I can simulate a ton of users joining a single room. And I can then sit there and watch for UI glitches or whatever. Um, so what I'm going to do now is walk you through how to create a new one, and then we'll um, try it. So now then, let's see if I can do this. This is um, foolishly brave, of course, but we'll see what happens. Right, now then, what we need is a terminal window. So here we are in the checked out um, in the checked out GitHub. So what we'll do is... Um, make a new directory and uh, we're going to be super lazy and um, basically just copy all of the files from two session into zone session um, and then in zone session we're going to edit them one by one to fix them um, so um, and that really in this case is 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 just a matter of um, changing some names Uh, that one doesn't need changing. So this one needs changing in a couple of places because Node.js expects you to export a named thing. Um, so this app is actually um, is for a book club. Um, which you'll see a little more of in a minute, but that's why it's club ID rather than. Um, so we change the URL and that's enough. And I have a feeling I've forgotten something important, but we'll find out. And we need to change this as well. Oh yes, I do know what I've forgotten. Right now, at this point, um, I'm going to bury. I want to, for the purpose of this test, I want to bury a session ID in here. So I need to generate one first. So we're going to go to rendezvous.zone and generate a session ID. Oh, okay. So we won't use that browser. Yes, indeed. Rendezvous.zone. Okay, so this we've got a session ID now, which we will plant into our script. Now you can see why for the single page, it was a lot easier to bury this into the page. But in this case, because I want to run a ton of them and I want to be in control of that, I decided to keep it as a script. So now we've got, um, we've, made a, we've made the requisite edits. So we're just going to do a deploy. Um, this takes a little while. So what we'll do is we will just Ah, yeah. Now, this is actually important, quite an important aspect. What you're doing when you do this is you're basically making a URL out there that costs you money. Right? So you want to be a little bit kind of, uh, you might want to put auth in front of it, depending on how expensive it is to run. Or you can do what I do, which is only to fire it up when I want to run some tests. And actually, they're surprisingly cheap to run. And you'll notice that in the script, I actually had, I buried the URL so that it can only test my app, it can't test anybody else's. It's not a sort of generic feature for testing everybody's WebRTC. Um, and what you see, um, whilst that's loading, I will show you 
this book club app. So the thesis of the book club app is that we all, like nine members of the book club, join the book club. We all get our little icons along the bottom. And then you will have the text of the book. I'm not going to do this here, but you'd have like the text of an EPUB book in the middle of the page. And then we can talk amongst ourselves in high quality audio. So I'm doing audio in a, um, uh, in a high quality way in that environment, um, spread out over a stereo space so that you can actually hear who's speaking. And they're lined up with their, uh, you should get a, a, we get a line of, um, of faces in, in fullness of time. In this test, you'll get a line of spinning green clocks. All right, so um, this has deployed itself. So now we can um, we can run it. Now I'm going to run this in the background because I want to run lots of them. So what should happen is after about 10 or 12 seconds, I should get a bunch of people storming into this uh, call with any luck. So what you can see there is that I've actually got a bug in the layout that if the um, if the sizing of those uh, things is is the wrong ratio, you end up with them overlapping. So you can find I've now found a bug in the UX of this this app, and um, these will now carry on running in an irritating way for a while, um, and then you can see them leave after after the forty seconds. Um, so we've got to about 19 seconds. I don't know if I can stand another 20 seconds of this. Probably not. But you can see the point. I might just hang up on them all. There you go. They're gone. Um, so, but but what's nice about that is it's actually relatively simple to do quite a bulky test of an app like that. Um, as it turns out that. I didn't actually do this. Like what finally triggered me into putting my the effort into this work wasn't actually that, although it's turned out to be very useful for that. What I actually did it for was um, the one of our customers on the um, pipe front who who's using pipe in a camera. We have a feature in that where you can um, you're running a small web OTC service in the camera, but you can actually have multiple people viewing the same. Um, H.264 stream or VP8 stream. So they, so we basically multi fan it out, multiplex it out to multiple users. So like more than one person can look at the security camera at the same time and still get live data. Um, so I got a question, which is like, how many live users can watch that at once? I said, well, I don't know. We'll have to test it. So I built a fan out test. Now, I was going to demo this, but actually it turns out to be impossible because what fails is I run out of uplink. And given that we're video recording this over my uplink, I think that would be imprudent. Um, but so what, what, it, what it basically showed was that um, the, the limitation wasn't in the code base uh, or, or even on the CPU of the, of the device, but it was actually the uplink of my, of my um, VDSL. Um, and in some cases, what you find is that the, the limitations on the Wi-Fi um, chipset. And there's a limited number of packets that Wi-Fi will cheap Wi-Fi chipsets will handle. I find that on the Raspberry Pi on a regular basis. So, so I'd done that, and I thought, well, actually, kind of, it'd still be interesting to know what you could do. So I then kind of split the problem out. So I split it out so that you've got the camera running a single stream, and then a second instance in, of pipe running in the cloud as a fan out. So it basically takes the stream in from the camera and then fans it out to a ton of users. Now, what I actually did was I found it out once to myself so I could see what was happening and 99 times to uh, Google Cloud Functions to see what happened. And to do that, obviously, you've got to monitor it somehow. So um, obviously, well, not obviously, but I, what I actually did was, was to watch one of them so you can check the video quality kind of that way. Um, and by the way, Puppeteer can take screenshots. So one of the features is you can like check that the UX on all of them looks reasonable by generating screenshots uh, as well. I actually didn't do that because Chrome, of course, generates RTCP stats for all the running calls. So what I did was I captured those back in the pipe agent and then aggregated them. So each of the 100 streams generates 
um, RTCP stats. So I aggregate them up into a little, I wrote a little bit of JavaScript that, that, that takes them, pulls them together. And then you can see that as the numbers climb up, the bandwidth goes up, but um, the numbers of lossy agents is, is still stays between zero and two. And I, what lossy was, um, was Chrome browsers that were reporting more than 2% packet loss. And so like basically very few of them and not much of the time. Um, and and it, it looked like it was actually the allocation of new, uh, new instances that was costing that. And one of the things about the way that this works is that it actually sends the UX as well. So it uploads the UX to the browser um, before it starts the video. So there's like, there's some cost in that. And I suspect that's where we, we're losing the odd packet. So the other sorts of monitoring you can do are provided by Google. Um, so in this case, we, we've got the, the VM that was running the fan out. Um, I've got the CPU load, which like, what was that? Um, 25% or so, which means that I've got a decent amount of headroom still. Um, it's doing 14 megabytes a second, mind you. Um, so like there's one of one of the bit mega megabit um, per second each. Uh, and that's 15k packets a second, which is like you can see why the Wi-Fi wouldn't have coped with that. Um, and uh, by the way, I think this cost me about a dollar, this test. So it's like it's not a super expensive thing to do. Um, and then this is the functions, how many instances of the functions are running for it, It's sort of, I don't really understand why that peak goes as far up as it does. There must have been some, um, it should have leveled out at a hundred like it did in the second test. So I ran this test twice um, when I when I captured these graphs. And for some reason, the first test had like overshoots, but uh, the second test levels out 101, which is what I'd expect. Uh, and then the final thing is, it turns out, as you saw from the um, original demo, it ends up going through a turn server. Because these cloud functions like deep within Google's infrastructure, deep behind NAT, you end up almost always using a turn server. So I ended up stressing my turn server, but it turns out to be a nice way of checking that the numbers are right. So the bandwidth is, it, of this correlates almost exactly with what uh, what we were seeing in on the fan out server. And I actually had this running in um, in Europe and had the turn server running in Europe and the um, uh, fan out server running in the US. So it's like really stressing the, um, the environment. So this is all great and fantastic, but there are some gotchas. Um, there are a couple of limitations basically. And it's really to do with the fact that we're abusing something that's supposed to be doing something slightly different. Um, like, they're limited to nine minutes max, absolute hard limit from Google on nine minutes for these things. So you can't use them for overnight soap tests or something like that. Uh, or you could keep running one after another, but but you can't have one that runs for, for more than nine minutes. Um, and as I said, the, the, these fake users, they're behind NAT. Um, so you end up having to use a turn server, which is like, in some situations, if you're trying to debug ICE, that's not helpful. Um, there's no, or, or MDNS or something, uh, there's no H.264. These are Chromium instances, they're not Chrome. So that in, in cases where that matters, that might be a problem. And getting auth done, like you said, I said, shared a session ID, that kind of makes it easy, but um, like if that was authenticated, then getting OAuth or something like that in there, um, or, or FIDO keys or whatever, it's like quite tricky. Um, because there's no keyboard to like interact with. Um, and all of these examples were done in G Cloud. It looks like AWS and Azure can do something pretty similar. They both got kind of competing um, offerings, but it looks to me, I haven't tried it, but it looks like you actually have to explicitly build the Docker image for them, that you can't just say, hey, use Node.js, because the Node.js's from these two don't include Puppeteer, don't support Puppeteer, whereas uh, the G Cloud one does. So the net result of that is I didn't need any phones, right? I did, I've done, a, I've done a, a soak, I've done a, a, a stress test of 100 users into an app without using a single phone, well, using one phone, I suppose. Um, and, and I could do this as a regular part of my development day. It's like, I can just use, you know, what's on my screen to test what's happening. 
Um, and that, that's a huge, huge thing. And as I say, it really isn't cheap. I said it cost me a dollar. I checked actually last night and for reasons I don't understand, I think it's because some feature is still in beta. Google credited me a dollar for it as well. So it actually ended up costing me nothing. So anyway, um, are we really happy to take questions in the Q&A or you can email me as Tim at Pipe and um, tweet at Steely Glenn. Thank you so much, Tim. Um, I, I've got so many questions, um, but I probably shouldn't ask them now. Um, I should probably wait for in a minute. Uh, when we'll be over on riot.comcon.xyz, um, the Riot Matrix installation, um, where we'll do Q and A afterwards. Um, that was fascinating. Like, just um, the, I, I remember you asking the question originally, and and, and being uh, and going, how is that even going to work? Like, I, I I know I know you can bring up Chrome and tell it, oh, here's some here's some fake media, um, but trying to do that within a within a headless function, I was like, there's no way that's going to work. So uh, that's amazing um, and could really, really kind of change and help people get going with 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 actually testing things in in today's world. Um, so that's that's really, really cool. Like I I develop mobile apps, so I've got like 10 phones on my desk at the moment. My desk is right there. Um, I've got like 10 phones on my desk right now because I'm doing loads of mobile app development. Um, but most people don't have 10 phones on their desk, um, and so they really, really struggle. So, um, great. Um, we'll head over to Riot um, and, and do Q&A over there. Um, and thank you very much, Tim. Yeah, no, thanks for the opportunity and looking forward to the questions. Don't go anywhere quite yet, though. We've got to say thank you to all of our sponsors. With Without them, none of this would have even happened in the first place. So... For our platinum sponsors, we've got Tulu, Voxphone, and Ciara. For our gold sponsors, we've got the Matrix Foundation, Vonage, Sangoma, Telviva, and Lowe. Our silver sponsors are Aptise, Pion, Telco Bridges with Pro SBC, Avoxy, 8x8 with Jitsi, and Firstcom Europe. And we've also got community sponsors, QXIP and Cycle Systems. Without any of them, this would never have even happened. You wouldn't have had all of this free content on YouTube. So go say thank you to all of them. Go look at what they provide, what services they offer, um, and have a, have a conversation with them all um, over on Riot, riot.comcon.xyz. The link will be in the description below, along with links to all of our sponsors. You can go and watch um, preview videos from all of our gold sponsors right now over on YouTube. The links will be somewhere over here. Um, all I've got to say is thank you to all of our sponsors um, and I'll see you over on the Q&A shortly. Cheers.